Ale tentokrát na to jde. to je narváno. Se taky můžem, no. na čípali, tam je ještě nějaký demo teďka, no, no. no. ale u Virgu ještě, ještě jsou výpinky, to je myslím jediný, no. to je Meridianu, no. Cisco je Zenitiusna, Leo je obsazený od dvou do půl šestý, Virgu je taky obsazený od Dvojku stáhni, hostesku asi mít nebudeme, to se taky pařili strašně holky. Should I turn it on? Yeah, yeah. You turn. Uh -huh.
All right, ob obviously the gala dinner was quite successful last night. <laughs> I can see everybody's <laughs> probably still sleeping. All right. My my name is <laughs> Otto Kreiter. I'm the chair of the monitoring session. And <clears throat> we will have four speakers during this session. So it will each presentation will be a bit shorter, only around twenty minutes. And first of all, I would like to invite Robert, Robert Schumann, who works for PSNC, and he's uh, engaged in the, in the Jan Free project and working on Persona to present uh, uh, a performance event uh, framework. Thank you. Please welcome, Robert. Thank you. Otto. Not this one. <laughs> Events MGM. Okay. So, welcome everyone. My name is Robert Schumann, uh, and I represent here Poznan Supercomputing and Networking Center from Poland. <laughs> where I'm working in Network Operations Center. Uh, today I would like to present to you the network performance event management based upon the personal framework. This work was done uh, in the scope of the Geon project. Uh, if it's enough time, I will tell you more about this uh, at the end. So first, short agenda of my presentation. After introduction and some requirements, I would like to tell you about alarms which we proposed and a few words about the personal. Then I will present you our event management architecture and its advantages. Uh, and next, a few words about the implementation and some words about the Jean project. So, introduction. Uh, first of all, we have to say that today, and uh, for, for, for uh, software for uh, network management and monitoring, uh, it is not enough to only uh, performing some active and passive measurements. Uh, because such software has to also uh, manage the events from the coming from the network. So to say, in other words, it has to handle uh, the network incidents. Without such, such functionality, uh, such software is just incomplete and it can be this, its main uh, uh, disadvantage. So our solution is some efficient and scalable event management functionality, especially designed for the multi-domain network monitoring. Uh, because I'm working in the NOC, so I can also tell you that uh, from everyday work, uh, it's quite often happened that we have so much different events coming from the network to the management stations that sometimes NOC staff can easily overlook some network incidents, some even uh, important alarms coming from the network. And our solution should support NOC staff not to overlook such network performance incidents. It is also prepared for extensions, for example, when some new alarms will be needed, but it not doesn't uh, touch on the alarms. It can be also some new functionality easily added. Uh, our solution also based on standards from OGF. I tell you about this later. And uh, we would like to repl replace uh, the already existing solution called NPM alarm service with our solution uh, because this, this solution was uh, created also for the Jean network a few years, few years ago, but uh, its uh, source codes or API are not available, uh, so we couldn't extend this solution and it's also not really coherent with the Persona framework. Uh, when it's ready, our software product it, it will be de deployed in Jean, Jean free service area. Uh, now we have two slides about the requirements which we have on the beginning for our solution. First of all, the most important is the scalability, which means that our solution should be applicable for multi-domain and highly distributed environment, which is very important. It is not only single domain, but multi-domain and distributed environment. It also means that uh, it should be resistant from some kind of errors uh, which can happen in, in different uh, modules in the software. 
Uh, also, the very important is the extensibility, which means here that uh, the user can, in easy way, add some new alarms, but also some new functionality can be added to the system, not only alarms. Uh, the flexibility means here that alarms conditions and the threshold values can be easily configurable by the user. It also means that the sh it should be, it, it will be developed some uh, easy to use interface for the user to uh, to define these alarms conditions. Uh, our solution also should base on standards. Uh, standards should be for communication between the different components as well as for the information model which describes the topology. And the second slide about the requirements, it's also that we should use some existing framework. Don't begin from, uh, don't do this from the beginning, but use some existing framework uh, which offers some basic functionalities, uh, especially such which are suitable for multi-domain environment. And for this purpose, we choose the Persona framework because it's uh, designed for multi-domain. Uh, also, the integration with already existing monitoring applications is very important. Uh, it means here that uh, this solution should have access to multiple network performance data sources. Uh, for example, in our NOC, uh, we are using MRTG statistics, wi which is based on uh, RD data files, and it can be one of the data sources for this imp uh, implementation. But also, they can be there uh, can be used some relational da databases like SQL or uh, the Hades uh, measurement archives could be also the data sources for this uh, solution. And the last but not least is uh, the requirements is that uh, user-friendly visualization should be available on client side. And here we choose uh, the Nagios application, which is uh, very commonly used and known in IT world. Uh, for example, in, in our NOC and uh, for Pioneer Network, which is National Polish Network, uh, we're using Nagios application to monitor some uh, network services. Uh, now we have two slides about alarms which we uh, choose to, to develop. Uh, these four alarms were chosen because, uh, first of all, they were used already in this NPM alarm service which we want to replace, <coughs> but also uh, that because uh, that alarms uh, was uh, uh, consulted with different users, for example, in LHC OPN community. Uh, so we have, first of all, the routing alarm which is raised if the path uh, as determined by trace route is changes, and in the same time, there are no light path down between the source and destination. Another kind of alarm is interface congestion alarm, which is raised if a router interface output drops is above a special threshold defined by user, and also in the same time, the router utilization, uh, in interface utilization is below another threshold. This cross-check of interface utilization value is needed to suppress some alarms which can co be caused, uh, cause output drops which are expected when the utilization is very high. And another two alarms, uh, routing out of network warning, uh, which is raised if the router, uh, if the route changes, and in the same, but, but in this way that uh, it includes some hops which are not in user-defined user list. So it means that just our routing went out of our network. Uh, and the last alarm is interface error, errors alarm, uh, which is raised if a router interface input errors is just above a threshold defined by user. Uh, here I can tell you also that uh, at this moment we uh, didn't develop yet uh, the functionality for informing users uh, via email or SMS or another way about these alarms, uh, so it's not re yet ready, but it's not a problem and it can be added in the future in easy way if it's needed. <coughs> now one slide and a few words about the personal, fr personal framework which we choose to use. Uh, first of all, Persona is, because maybe a, lo a lot of you knows, but, but for those who don't know, it's a multi-domain infrastructure for network performance monitoring. And we have to add here that it's uh, highly scalable and highly distributed uh, infrastructure. It includes a set of services which delivers performance measurement in a federated environment. And such services act as a so-called intermediate layer because they act between the performance measurement points and visualization applications. 
Personal is also a standardized uh, solution. It, it uses standard uh, for communication, like NMC protocol, and standard for information model, uh, which is called which is called NM. Oh, both standards are uh, coming from Open Grid Forum OGF. Uh, it's also very easy to add some new functionalities to this framework, and uh, our case is here, I think, the best uh, example because what we're doing, we're just adding the new functionality for events management to the Personar framework. And Personar uh, was developed many years already uh, inside the wide collaboration. Uh, this collaboration was between different institutions, first of all the GN2 and uh, GN3 projects, and also some US institutions like Internet2 or ESnet but also the collaboration was with Brazil, with RNP institution. And now I have a few slides about uh, our solution for event management and its architecture. Uh, first of all, we have to say that we have considered different variants of architecture uh, which uh, differ between each other depending on which side we want to place the new functionality for alarms detection. Uh, it could be on the client side or on uh, the service, uh, personal service side or somewhere in the middle. And finally, we have chosen the most distrib distributed one, the architecture. Uh, I will show you in the moment. <coughs> uh, this architecture also has uh, some user-defined rules for creating events and, and users can also uh, define the thresholds values. Uh, it characterized also by a clear separation of basic, uh, basic functionalities like storage, like alarms detection and visualization. Uh, it's also because it perfectly suits within the personal infrastructure and such uh, separation uh, of these basic functionalities is coming from the personal infrastructure. Uh, now we have a picture which present uh, very generally the architecture of our solution, but here only in the single domain view. Uh, what we can see that we have three different modules uh, inside the personal infrastructure, and one module uh, out of personal, which is a visualization client, uh, which we propose here, the, the Nudges application. And how it works, that first of all, we have the monitoring data sources on the left side, and there can be how I said before, RRD uh, files, uh, it can be um, SQL databases or HADES uh, mutual ar archives, and they monitor the, the network, and uh, all these measurements are sent using personal protocol, which is here NMC protocol. They are sent to the new uh, service, which we call here the alarms detection. In this service, all these measurements are analyzed, uh, are compared to the thresholds and analyzed using the user-defined rules for, for alarms, and the new alarms are detected and generated. Uh, all these new generated alarms are sent also using personal protocol to the alarm storage functionality, uh, which can be also uh, just the, the personal measurement archive, but separated one here with the separated database uh, to store all these alarms. And finally, the Aggregated alarms are sent using also the personal protocol NMC uh, to the visualization client uh, here, the Nagios application. Uh, the Nagios uh, has to have also uh, the plugin here uh, to communicate via personal protocol with alarm storage. How I said it was, it is only the single domain view to show you how it works, but here now we have a slide with, uh, which shows the multi-domain view. Uh, so we can see, that for example, we have three different domains. Uh, each domain uh, has uh, separated uh, their own instance of personal with uh, their own alarms detection functionality. Uh, and this, this alarms detection can be uh, configured in different ways uh, in between the domains because the users in domain A, for example, can define different thresholds than the users in domain B for this alarms detection. And finally, all these uh, alarms stored in alarm storage and from different domains are sent or retrieved by uh, the personal protocol uh, to the Nagios application. So we have a situation that in one place in Nagios, 
we can visualize uh, all the events, all the alarms uh, from different domains in, in one place. So this is the multi-domain view. <coughs> and uh, so the main advantages of this architecture, uh, first of all, the personal it provides a set of already existing functionalities, like I said before, like storage or service lookup, which are prepared especially for multi-domain environment, and, and our architecture is using the same way, so it's also for multi-domain environment. Uh, this distributed nature of personal services uh, helps also to easily add some new functionalities or system components, uh, and also in our solution, you user can not only add some new alarms in an easy way, but also some new functionalities uh, and uh, even new implementations for some services. Uh, and the separation of components uh, allows to replace them dynamically. So uh, we, we can use the event management service without stopping it and in the same time uh, doing some upgrades on, for example, measurement, some measurement archives, the data sources. Uh, or even replace them uh, dynamically uh, with some uh, new implementation or written even in, in different programming language. <coughs> and one slide about the implementation. Uh, this implementation is uh, being developed now. Uh, we have chosen Java implementation with web services, so it's similar like in personal NDM uh, implementation. Uh, our implementation will, will use also PSBase, which is the library for services in personal MDM. Uh, it has some uh, common, commonly used functionalities for the services. It, it will be the open source, of course, with BSD-like license. And the plugin for visualization in Nagios, uh, what I already said, which is needed to communicate uh, for, uh, for Nagios to communicate via personal NMC protocol with the uh, um, alarm storage. It's being developed now. Uh, the implementation finally is scheduled uh, for the Perfsomar MDM next release, which should be in August or September on this year. Uh, and we also plan the, some early pilot implementation uh, before this final version, uh, which should be provided uh, for some testing. Uh, some additional informations uh, because uh, here we don't have enough time to, to go very much into details in this uh, presentation, uh, but uh, we have prepared before the detailed specification document which is available on website uh, of GM Free project. So if anyone is interested uh, more in these details, technical details, uh, then please read this specification document. Uh, here you can see the uh, URL for this link, uh, but unfortunately it is accessible only for a community of this project. Uh, but it's not a problem because if, if you don't have the access and you still would like to read the specification document, then please send us an email because we, the authors of this project in PSNC team, uh, will be very glad to answer any of your questions sent via email or uh, to send you this uh, specification document if you are interested. Um, some more, more info about uh, Personal MDM, it's also available on this link, uh, personal.jaun.net, uh, but this is only about the implementation of per called Personal MDM, so the European one, and the US institutions has their own implementation in different places. Uh, I don't know, yeah, time is going to finish, so very shortly about the one slide about the Jaun project and network. Uh, generally, this is the European Educational and Research Network, which has, how you can see on these pictures, connections all around the world. Uh, the GN3 project contract, total funding from European Commission is for 93 million euro. It started from 1st April 2008, and so now we finished already the second year and be began the third year of this project. Um, about the network, we can say that together with Europe's national research networks, uh, the Jean connects about 40 million users in over 8,000 institutions and across about 40 countries. So you can see that it's a very large project and network, and uh, we are proud to be a member of this project. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. 
here you can see also my name and my email address if you are if you have any questions or if you are interested in this uh, specification detailed document then please send me an email and we will reply as soon as possible thank you very much thank you robert uh, any question from the audience yeah Uh, there has been a problem uh, with Persona MDM 3.2 concerning performance. If you have a lot of data or a lot of interface uh, which you want to check. Uh, and uh, the information I got one year ago was, yes, it could be a problem with the exist database. But I haven't heard if this was fixed or not. Do you have any, uh, any information? Personally, I'm not uh, the developer or Persona. Uh, we only use this framework to do our job, but uh, what I know what I heard uh, that uh, I heard also about these problems. I know that some colleagues from PSNC, for example, some developers are working on this. They are testing some different uh, solutions than, than exist. Uh, and uh, I think that we just have to wait for new releases uh, which are coming and it should be solved, I think. I don't know when exactly, but they're working so on this. So the s a special question is, is it fixed in, in the new release in uh, August, September? Yeah. Can I answer it, leaving my chair hat uh, <laughs> off, so <laughs> putting the giant. Uh, I, they are working on it, and then they are expecting the next release to be fixed, and they will provide much better performance for that particular uh, problem you signaled. And another question, uh, the authorization, or authentication. It's mm -hmm. based on Geon identity provider accounts, uh, as far as I know. Uh, as far as I know, in, in, in Persona, there is also some service for authentication and authorization. Yes, but it's uh, uh, based on Jean identity provider account. So a normal user cannot access it uh, unless he had, has uh, such an account. And the question is, uh, can I configure my service so that uh, I can uh, check who is allowed or who not? Uh, the question was, uh, can you... Uh, normally the authentication goes this way, someone connects uh, to, to the system and uh, provides his authentication, that is his Jean identity provider account, and mm -hmm. you get back, yes, he is allowed, he, he has a valid account. But what I want to do is uh, to have a, a, a user group uh, access only. Mm -hmm. Is this possible? I will try to get you to the personal product manager who is probably still sleeping. <laughs> Should be here now. <laughs> and I think he can answer that question to you. Okay, we have uh, one more question and then we have to move on. Yeah. Hello. W um, with your approach, how easy is it to swap out the visualization end part, for example, to use OpenNMS instead of Nagios? Uh, it uh, shouldn't be a problem here, but uh, because we we just uh, take the nudges as an example that we, we can use, uh, just giving or uh, developing some uh, additional plugin to to it. So the requirement is only that it should uh, communicate with the alarm storage using personal NMC protocol. So if you have such plugin, for example, for OpenNMS, it shouldn't be a problem to visualize these alarms. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Robert. Thank and, you. Uh, I would like to invite another Robert, <laughs> Robert Kisteleki from uh, RIPE, and uh, he will talk to us about the Atlas, about the Internet Measurement Network. I think his bio is available on the Terena page, so I'm not going to repeat it, but he's, he's quite impressive. So. I'm afraid that it's available on Google as well, so it's, <coughs> that part is even more scary, actually. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. So I'm Robert Kirstarecki. I'm working for the RIPEN CC uh, in the science group, uh, which is basically the R&D department of the RIPEN CC. Uh, and if you are not aware of that, the RIPEN CC is the regional internet registry for Europe and surrounding areas. Today I'm going to talk uh, about RIPE Atlas, a new project that we started roughly uh, in uh, November last year. Uh, but first of all, so the, in different contexts, there are many, many atlases. You may be aware of VeriSign Atlas, Arbor Atlas. This is RIPE Atlas, uh, just to, to avoid the name confusions. Basically, what it is, is a new kind of measurement network that we are just building uh, with the potential to scale up to thousands or tens of thousands of measurement nodes around the internet. 
Uh, and we just started last November, so we are just building the whole thing, and hopefully it's going to be useful. Um, starting point. This is the light map of Europe uh, during the night. Uh, what you really can see here is that the lights are where the populated areas are. So that kind of makes sense. That's where people are. But it's not really difficult to make the, the leap in thought to say, well, that is also where the internet is. That's where people are. That's where the users are. So how can we measure the internet from the places where we actually have the people using it? Then we tried to do a simulation and what would happen if we had enough measurement nodes, enough points on the internet to observe what's going on. So we did the simulation and said, let's assume that we have a thousand uh, measurement nodes distributed in Europe. These are uh, a thousand randomly picked IP addresses and then geolocate on the map. Okay, so what if we have 5,000? What if we have 10,000? What if we have 20,000? And you can see that uh, if we go higher up in numbers, then this map resembles more and more the light map that we saw before. So this gives us the intuition that if we have enough nodes then, and we can measure from them, then we can uh, have an overview of, yep, this is where people are, this is where the internet is, this is where we should measure from. Then what we did is simulate a problem. So going back, let's assume that we have like this 10k probes around the internet. What if a real big problem happens? How can we actually capture that? So we did simulate a problem. In this case, uh, we simulated one single AS having a hard time uh, connecting to anywhere else. So all the probes which are read there uh, are in the single AS, again, geolocated, and we said, no, oh, okay, so make them red, showing that there is a problem there. Now, if you look closely, it's actually a shape of a country, right? So that gives us also the intuition that, hmm, okay, if we have enough nodes, we can, we can get some more interesting data out of it. So based on this, we would like to believe that um, if there was such a network, it's, it makes more sense to build a single bigger network than individual smaller ones, basically because it w gives us this situational awareness. Um, if we have such a network, then we can also fulfill the individual benefits. That is, if you want to do this kind of network, you want to do your measurements, uh, you can use this network. Uh, you have more vantage points for you available if th the architecture is right for this, and you have more data available for yourself. But it also has community benefits, which means that our community, the ISP community, has a, more, a better situational awareness of what's going on, and they can get access to more data about it. So that was the plan. Um, we concluded that if we really want to go this way, we need enough vantage points. We need more what we call probes or measurement nodes. Um, some of you may be uh, uh, familiar with TTM, our test traffic measurement uh, infrastructure, which is a distributed set of uh, big rack server machines, but it's just way too expensive to put um, those kind of machines everywhere. And besides, you ha would have a hard time deploying that in home environments, so that's just not good. So what we opted for is instead smaller probes, which should be easily deployable. If they are USB powered, then powering is just solved because USB is virtually everywhere, and it should be 24-7 uh, capable. We ended up with these small guys. These are actual uh, servers, Linux is running on them, so they do the job for us. Um, on one hand, they receive USB power. On the other hand, they can con you can connect to uh, the wired internet. Some deployment scenarios in a home, in a co-location, in another co-location. The yellow arrows there show that even in a server environment, USB ports are just available. So it just this it just works. Okay. Um, plans and where we are. Version zero has been deployed uh, in November. What it does is that if you host such a device, you plug it into the network, it automatically starts to do fixed measurements. So it has some built-in measurements. Uh, we are measuring uh, RTT to IP on IPv4 and IPv6 to some DNS root servers and through some uh, RIPE servers. Uh, in the next version, what we would like to do is to uh, allow you, the host of these devices, to schedule your own measurements using this network. So if you participate in the network saying, hey, I'm willing to run this, uh, I give it some power, I give it an internet connection, I give it some kilobits of bandwidth, it's really not much, uh, then you can get back in return the, the ability to do your own measurements using the full extent of the network. That's really what we really want to do. And later on, we are willing to, to listen, what else should we do? What kind of measurements we would like to do? Specific non-goal is performance measurements, so we are not measuring bandwidth. That's uh, 
due to a couple of reasons, but mainly we don't want to abuse home networks, and also the device is only uh, capable of up to like 20 megabits, which is usually not enough in Europe, hopefully. Um, this is all online, so I just wanted to flesh uh, this on. This is the current extent of the network. The green, pro the green triangles show uh, nodes which are up. The red ones show nodes which are down. And it's perfectly fine that some, are, some of them are down. Uh, the idea being if we have enough probes, then ultimately it doesn't matter how many of them are down. Well, we expect that like 10 to 20% will be down at any given point in time. Zooming in on Europe, uh, again, this is online, so you can zoom in to your own favorite area. Uh, obviously, what we can see is that the eastern parts of Europe is, uh, well, more sparse, let's just say. So we would be happy to host more probes there. The extent of the network, uh, I wanted to put this up because it very well illustrates that there is a huge demand. It seems that people like the idea. The green line shows the actual probes up. So those are up and running. We're close to 400 now. We already distributed close to 600, which means that um, not all the probes that we actually gave to people are online. People just um, put it in the bags and then they just forget about it every now and then. So we are nudging them to not to do that. Uh, but you can also see that we have roughly 900 or so people waiting for such a probe. So demand is high. Okay. Now, building such a network is not easy. We, as the RIPEN CC, we cannot deploy these probes everywhere around Europe or anywhere else. As you could see, uh, we have some presence in the US and, and virtually all continents. So we are looking for people who are willing to participate. If you want to become a host, that means that you can host such a device, give it some power, give it an internet connection, and that's it. Uh, what you need to do, donate a fraction of your bandwidth, some electricity. What you do get is you become a member of this community. You will be recognized as that, as such. You already have access to the results of the built-in measurements, so you get some graphs saying, whoa, this is how I see the world, at least parts of it. And later on, you will also have, as I said, the ability to schedule your own measurements using any probe in the network. So you can say, measure my server, the RTT to my server from wherever, the US and Europe and Asia, and the system will select some probes and do that measurement for you. Uh, this is available live. I'm not going to go into the details. What you get out of it now, if you plug it in today, is a set of RRD graphs showing your ping times. This is a, a specific example. I, I, I love this because this was contributed by one of our users uh, from Hurricane. What you can see here is this is a probe that they plugged in and they didn't really mind. It was doing its job. And then at Sunday, the guy was looking at the graphs and said, this should not be. Something is going wrong here. So forget about the right-hand side for a moment. What he saw was that there is a consistent 100 and, I don't know, 10 milliseconds or so connection to our destination. But during the day, it just jumps up to three times as much. So the conclusion was, guys, something is wrong. We can do 100 milliseconds. It's very stable. So if it has to jump up to 300 milliseconds, and it's very consistently jumping up there, so that must be some kind of configuration error. So they went on and investigated. It turns out that this probe was in uh, Fremont, I believe, in California, and it's measuring M route, which is like 20 miles away in uh, Palo Alto. So it's, you know, for 20 miles, 100 milliseconds, that's just not good. Turns out that they are kind of missed some kind of appearing relation uh, there, and they fixed it. When they fixed it, the uh, RTT towards the destination dropped to virtually zero, so like three milliseconds or something. Now, these guys are very capable network operators. It's not that they, they couldn't fix this before. It's just that this device gave them a very easy entry, right? They just plugged it in and they supplied them data. So they looked at the data and said, oh, we can do better. And then they optimized the network and they can do better, indeed. This is a different visualization. This is all the probes uh, that have supplied some kind of data towards one of our servers, which is hosted in Amsterdam. Uh, so what you can see here is the R IPv4 RTT is color-coded. So green means it's like less than 10 milliseconds, and red means ab above, or close or above 500. Uh, it really, really makes sense. The closer you are to the destination, the smaller the RTTs are. So this kind of makes sense. But if you go online and check this out, you will see that there are uh, quite a number of interesting exceptions. Uh, we can spot different areas, even inside Europe, where connectivity is consistently worse than anywhere else. If you host such a probe, you can pinpoint yourself on the map, and you can see 
what we see about you. Okay, next level. Beyond looking for hosts who host these devices, we are also looking for sponsors because obviously if you want to deploy thousands of these guys, uh, it's going to cost and operating the network and development and so on and so forth. The NCC cannot do this alone because we would be spending too much of our members' money. That They wouldn't like that probably. So we are looking for sponsors who are really into the idea and are willing to, to join in and say, well, this is good. I would like to sponsor you like eight probes, 16 probes. I even may want to get those probes so I can deploy them wherever I want to, but you don't have to say that. If you're a sponsor, you can say, I'm for the idea, I don't really mind where they are deployed. But as a sponsor, you get your own benefits. Uh, you also are recognized, that's easy, but you also get more credits, I will go into the details a bit later, which means you can do more measurements. So if you're a host, you can do this much, if you're a sponsor, you can do that much. You also have the access to fixed measurements, so the results from all the probes that you sponsored. So if you sponsor, I don't know, 50 in Europe, then you will get uh, the results from those 50 immediately. And also, you will have the chance to do your measurements from any probe on the network a bit later. And yes, and you can see we have this geek compatible pricing, so everything is a power of two, obviously. Okay, um, the way we imagine this to work is that if you are participating in this network, either as a host or as a sponsor, you accumulate credits. Credits are, it's just an abstract term, they're proportional to, to your contribution. So if you just plug this in and it's run up and running, you will accumulate credits automatically. That's how you get credits. And then you can spend them on your own measurements. Right? And we will figure out how much it costs to do a measurement. But the basic idea here is that if you're running uh, such a probe, if you're hosting it, you should be able to do a couple of, of ping measurements of your own choosing. Okay. Obviously, if you're a sponsor, you can do bigger measurements. Uh, some people ask about the details. What do we use? This is what we use currently. So the current generation of the probes is uh, using this device, Lamptronics Export Pro device, which is a very small uh, device. It's not very resourceful, but it does the job. It runs a full, uh, somewhat limited Linux. And if you understand some of those acronyms, then you know that this is tough to do. Um, interesting points here is that we can remotely update the firmware. So if you have such a device and we develop new functionality, we can deploy that to your probe as well. So for example, if this is plugged into your home, then we can activate the camera and the microphone and that kind of stuff. Um, it turns out that the form factor and the USB powering is just right. Uh, if you don't re really, really look closely, then this is just a bump in the cable. Um, in my home environment, we, I have such a mess in the corner, I don't even notice that it's there which is pretty much the idea. Okay, some of the security aspects, uh, we have these questions most of the time. Uh, if someone takes apart this probe and tries to attack the system, there is not much information you can gain from it. Obviously, you can look at what code is running it, what, it, what it's doing, but um, you will not be able to attack the whole system because there is nothing shared between all the probes except for the code is running on it. So they have uh, trust material, they have keys, and also they have the trust material to our central servers, so that means that these probes, uh, unless you really hack them, they will not connect to another network. So it's really difficult to fool them to uh, do something else. Also, uh, we, one of the design goals was that we want these probes to work in a home environment, and in a home environment, it's very, very likely that you're going to use some kind of NAT device. But since the probe is only active, so it is connecting outwards towards our infrastructure, and it's man doing measurements outwards, uh, this is not a problem. It works perfectly fine with NATs. Uh, and finally, we are making this promise that we are not doing passive measurements on your own home network, so we don't know <coughs> what other traffic is there. We don't want to know, and we are not going to build those kind of components. But if you're concerned, feel free to firewall it off, put it into a different segment, and it's just fine. And that's about it. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we have some questions. I see that we have some questions. Can I be cheeky and ask two questions? Go ahead. First one is, have you looked at using PoE for this so you can just simply plug it into a switch port, no USB? Yes, we did, and we decided not to go that way. Um, the reason is that very, very few people would actually use it, and the production cost would be just enormous. Um, we recommend to use converters for that. So you go to the corner shop and for 10 bucks you can buy a PoE converter, PoE to USB, and it's just done. 
So for the few people who actually need that, it just works. And second one is, I saw you're doing DNS measurements. Are you doing uh, DNSSEC measurements so we can see where DNSSEC is available and deployed? Um, it is possible. It's certainly possible. Uh, what we would like to do with DNS is that you should be able to say, do this kind of DNS lookup. And if it's about the uh, DNS key, and if it's about something else, it just works. I don't think we will do like zone validations and so on, because it's, that's not the point. But whether the, the keys are available, uh, whether I can get that zone, that kind of stuff is certainly possible, yes. Not yet, but it's in the making. More questions from the audience? Nobody, then I have one, actually. Okay. Uh, how much effort uh, you have you put in this? I mean, how, how many people are working in this? Uh, perhaps in an um, FD figure? Or so far, there are three, peop three, three and a half people working on it uh, since last summer-ish or so. So um, depending on you think that's um, too much or not, I think that the results are reasonable compared to this, but we are extending our development capacity here, especially because of the user-defined measurements. Um, that is going to be something that will require some, some more thoughts and more development. All right, well, that answers a lot of questions. Okay. Um, some projects perhaps now start to look. Hmm. All right, well, uh, okay. thank you, Robert. Thank that you. Was a very good presentation. I would like to invite our next speaker, uh, Freik Dijkstra. Uh, I'm not sure I can tell your <laughs> surname very correctly, but uh, he's from the University of Amsterdam, and uh, he will talk about uh, how to integrate NML in the end-to-end -end monitoring system of and to end-to-end -end monitoring of the persona. One minute. <laughs> yeah. Five seconds. No, yes. oh, let me just put it in my pocket. So. Okay. Thank you very much. One, one correction. I work for Sara, the Dutch ah. Supercomputing Center. Uh, on that, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to give you a little presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, enhancing end-to-end -end monitoring with NML topology exchange. And I will first tell a bit about end-to-end -end mon for those of you who are not familiar with it and about NML and the problem we have in our early experience and early implementation. End-to-end um, -end mon, uh, probably familiar to, to most of you, is uh, the status monitor in uh, Personar. It measures uh, uh, basically status of light paths, so it's uh, the only non-IP layer but below IP layer measurement in, in Persona. Uh, like all Persona, it uses NMC protocol uh, and NM uh, information scheme for the exchange of information. Uh, two main implementations, as you probably all know. Um, this is a screenshot of um, uh, the status monitor. Uh, what you see is that it actually measures uh, the states of multiple domains and the, the uh, 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 interface uh, status of, of uh, uh, well, interface of a light path. So it says if it's up or uh, down, uh, and if the administrative status is normal or uh, in service or, or in maintenance. Um, it's actually one of the, in my view, uh, pretty successful uh, uh, measurement uh, tools in Persona because it's relatively widely deployed. It's used for, for example, LHG OPN. In it too has uh, quite a lot of deployments as well. But there are some problems with it, in my view. Um, one of the main problems, I think, is uh, uh, especially if there you have uh, an end-to-end -end path and one of the domains doesn't support end-to-end uh, -end MON. You have some missing information and it does, uh, has a hard uh, has problem um, um, visualizing that data if there is some missing information or if there is some wrong information, in fact, which sometimes happens because um, one domain has to point to the other domains so you can uh, link those together. But uh, typically one domain might change their names or if there's a typo in that name you will have a problem and the, the results will be skewed. Um, so actually all operators need to, to have this concept and support this, which is one of the problems. Uh, another problem um, which is listed in the end there is that um, 
it's actually quite a standalone uh, service. For example, all the topology information of Persona is configured within some uh, uh, configuration scripts. So there's no integration, for example, with, with uh, Autobahn system, which has a different topology view. Um, and as you see, all these limitations are actually limitations in the topology representation, not in the measurement data itself. So let's look at the current architecture. The current architecture, there's, there's some polar, which uh, pulls the data, typically with SNMP, from uh, the status information of each uh, port uh, of an end event path. <coughs> puts it in a MySQL database. There's a lot of configuration files uh, which describe the topology and, of course, which ports has to be pulled. And both that information is on the left-hand side, so the status and the topology information, and that's transferred to an end-to-end -end monitoring uh, system, which is basically the website I just showed. Now, what I like to do is split that out. So we really have the measurement on one hand, and the other hand, the topology service. And one of the advantages, obviously, is that you can easily more integrate that with, for example, the Autobahn system so that uh, every surface has the same topology view as all the other surfaces. Uh, of course, the question is, okay, um, we used the end uh, 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 sorry, the Persona uh, protocol, and what protocol do we have to use right now? And what tools do we have to use? So my first view is, okay, let's just enhance uh, uh, end um for at least the measurement point, and for the topology surface, okay, what shall we use? And uh, actually, I'm pretty happy that uh, Roman Laparche uh, of uh, PSNC, uh, well, I put a typo on there, that says Persona, he works obviously for PSNC, uh, wrote a document uh, uh, along with some other people from PSNC um, about the integration of Autobahn and Persona. And what they said basically is okay, we can use the NML for the topology uh, description, and in fact, they also uh, create some preliminary schemas for that. Now, let me tell you a bit more about NML. NML, uh, uh, and I should say that I'm one of the co-chairs of the NML working group within the OGF, so there's some bias here, obviously, uh, is a standard schema, not a language, actually, so it's a pretty bad name, sorry for that, uh, for exchanging network topology information. We've been doing the standardization for quite a while, which is uh, uh, indeed quite a m more interesting problem than I anticipated when I started this effort. And uh, we put some people together uh, uh, trying to get one single uh, topology uh, uh, description out. For example, we had the University of Amsterdam, there it is. Um, but also uh, people from CNES uh, at some point, uh, UNIS, which was uh, basically the uh, people from Persona in, uh, for Internet2, uh, but also people from France, from India, which had uh, VDXL, which is also a network description for, uh, format. And what the output we will have is some UML schema, and which will represent both an XML and RDF, because we had a lot of discussion, which was, of course, fun, just like every standardization. Okay, what uh, syntax are we going to use? So we more or less decided, well, we just have one schema and have two syntaxes. Okay, that's fine. Uh, NML, uh, what's in scope? We're going to uh, describe a logical network infrastructure. So it's really uh, the network uh, uh, management, not the inventory management. So we're not describing the physical network infrastructure. Uh, one of the key features uh, is that it describes multi-layer networks, so really it correlates the different layers of the network together. So uh, one of the uh, particular use cases is a measurement, network measurement uh, of network descriptions below the IP layer as well. So for example, you can correlate the Ethernet layer with the SCH layer, and currently that's, that's done completely uh, independent of each other. And what will happen then is if one network uses Ethernet and the other network uses SCH, they have a problem uh, uh, describing their networks, and you have all kinds of problems, especially if, if uh, you uh, have multiplexing adaptation, meaning that you have multiple Ethernet channels, multiple VLANs in that same SDH layer. Um, it has configuration capability, but that's more or less also in scope of the network measurement. Uh, just two or three slides, just going briefly what we do, uh, I'm not going to details, uh, one of the key points I'm, I'm, I like to stress is that we base our work uh, on the functional elements in the ITUT D100, which is a standard uh, uh, description of how to describe multi-layer networks. So, for example, all the layers who could look like this using all those building blocks from G800. If you'd like to know more, please ask, but I'm not going to details, I'll just abuse a bit of my time to show you a bit of, uh, about NML. Uh, this is our current schema. Also, I'm not going to detail, so we defined uh, a few things like nodes, ports, uh, links, etc. We're not using the G800 terminology, even though we use the concepts, but that's because, in my view, the G800 terminology is uh, not so good. Uh, unless you really like terms like uh, uh, 
uh, network uh, uh, termination connection points and things like that. Um, two points we decided upon I'd like to uh, point out, which is uh, a bit uncommon. Uh, we use unidirectional links, and one of the reasons for that, uh, rather than bidirectional links, is uh, uh, the way we describe uh, uh, broadcast or multicast uh, 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 domains. Um, most uh, topology descriptions use bidirectional links, but as soon as you're going to, to describe a broadcast domain, you have a problem. Uh, for that reason, we decided as the basic building blocks, the unidirectional links, and then some grouping to combine that, and, and we're going to extend that a bit later on. Uh, the other point I'm going to make is that we use identifiers, which typically start with and OGF network, and probably you've seen a few of these before. In fact, they are in use already uh, by two different groups, which are, of course, incompatible, don't you love standardization? Um, and the only thing is, uh, I'm point I'm going to make is, if you ever see a urine OGF network, it doesn't mean it has to be an NML description. It could be one of these other description. One of uh, is used in the Glyph uh, community, and another one is uh, uh, used, uh, I think, at least in, in Oscars. Um, another point. As I was saying, NML um, is able to relate different uh, 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 layers together, and the topology of different layers together. So how do we do that? Um, just, just briefly. Um, we define only uh, links, which is uh, the same as the G800 link connection concept. Uh, only we just uh, use a shorter word uh, uh, for brevity. Um, there's the relationship on the left-hand side is something you're all familiar with, which is just a serial compound relationship. You just concaten of you you have uh, a lot of segments, uh, uh, put them in series, and you have an end-to-end -end path. And you can do that recursively. So if you have, for example, the other way around, you have an end-to-end -end path, you can uh, segment that in, in different segments. And if you have one segment, you can segment that further on as, as far as you, you like, depending on how much detail you like. And that's a way to uh, uh, have the, the really the segmentation in multiple domains. Um, there are different relationships. The second one is, is actually the parallel compound relationships. For example, if you have uh, uh, data which uh, goes over different paths, for example, for protection, so if one link goes down, you can go the other way around, or multipath, uh, TCP, for example, or link bundling, or things like that, you have a re a parallel compound relationships. And the third relationship we defined is adaptation, so really the cross-layer uh, relationship. And the one you see on the right-hand side is, is, in this case, uh, uh, the multiplexing uh, adaptation. Right now, the syntax uh, we described, because standardization takes quite a long time, so we had a lot of fights about terminology discussions, really nice. Uh, we finally uh, uh, got people so tired that, that we put them in a room, locked them up, and uh, uh, they were only were allowed to went out uh, have, having a schema, so we did that, which now started to work, and we're starting to see some schema since uh, November, which is uh, pretty nice. Um, so we use NML for topology schema. That was... Uh, the extended uh, 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 version of that. So what do we have now? Well, currently uh, 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 we have just manually crafted topology files available. In the end, of course, it, we also like to have a topology discovery, uh, um, and that's, that's on the roadmap, but uh, it's not there yet, and we're working on that. So that's for the topology service. So what do we do for the measurement service? Um, as I said, my first uh, uh, goal was to use, okay, enhance uh, end to end mon, and, and keep the rest as is. Maybe later uh, scrubbing the topology information out, uh, why not? Well, one of the problems I encountered that uh, uh, in my view there are some protocol limitations in, in actually all of Persona, including end to end mon. And the reason is that actually it's, it's too flexible in, in, in some sense. Um, uh, the strange thing is if you look at, at, at uh, uh, NMC uh, message uh, uh, as defined in NMC, uh, working group in .jf. It is XML, and uh, it's a message format with two types, uh, metadata and data uh, uh, sub-tags. Um, and as you can write, the data can point to metadata, and the metadata can even point further to metadata, which is extremely flexible, and I like that. But uh, it's embedded in a SOAP message, but the advantage of a SOAP message comes if you have a whistle file, and you can validate that, that message. However, this protocol is so flexible that it's hardly possible to create any useful whistle files. I haven't seen one. The only thing that creates is a top layer uh, tag, which is nice, but doesn't buy me anything because I have to do the validation, the correlation between the different tags myself anyway. So I have to parse the XML uh, myself. And, and so 
doesn't buy me anything. So it's actually a bit odd that, that those measures are embedded in SOAP. So uh, one of the things I was looking, okay, is there any alternative uh, to this, uh, which probably use, uh, I can get to work a, a, a bit uh, faster than that. So I looked into Arna's uh, Persona NetConf, which is actually the subject of the next talk. So I'm not going to more, more detail, but I think that that's, uh, at least for uh, research perspective, uh, a nice uh, uh, alternative. Um, and I can do that obviously because I'm in a, a, a JRA, a Joint Research Activity, rather than an SA. Because there's obviously, if I'm going to deploy that full scale, uh, incompatibility uh, issues there. So, one of the things um, I'm trying to do, which is quite some work, uh, in fact, more than I anticipated, is uh, splitting up that monitoring and topology surface, but also looking, okay, how can I correlate this to an existing surface? And it's not only about uh, compatibility and, and backwards compatibility that I'm going to look into that. It's also uh, because I want to see how the topology uh, uh, description of NML relates to other topology descriptions. And especially if you have unidirectional links on one hand and mul uh, bidirectional links on the other hand, you see some problems and some, some logic you have to, to think about. For example, one of the things I come across, which didn't have to do with that unidirectional thing, is that in NML, we could say, okay, a path consists of multiple segments. So this segment, this segment, this segment, and this segment then consists of these smaller segments. I could do that. But I wasn't able to say, okay, this small segment is part of this end-to-end -end path without knowing all the other segments, which was actually a flaw, so we had to fix it in NML. And this is one of the things uh, we're actually doing, looking, okay, how stable is NML? Does it live up to the task? And there are some other people implementing as well, but they're mostly looking into um, uh, provisioning and pathfinding rather than monitoring. So hopefully we get some topology description which is useful for actually both uh, applications. And perhaps also stuff like visualization. Um, I have three more slides. How many time do I have? Um, and there's actually not really much to do with uh, 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 the basic task I was assigned to in, in uh, Persona, but what I figured out talking to our network operators, um, um, there are some practical limitations in Persona. Um, as you've seen in, in one of the first slides in the, in the screenshot, um, the current states of Persona are operational status and administrative safety status. The operational status can be up, degraded, or down. In practice, you will see up and down, and administrative will typically just say normal operation. Now, let's take one step back. What's, what's the purpose of, of end to end mode? That is finding a dome domain with an error. And if there is an error, uh, pinpointing which domain I have to contact to fix it. Because it, these end to end light paths typically cross uh, uh, four, five, six, seven sometimes domains. And if there's a fault, I like to know who co to contact, uh, especially because those domains cross multiple time zones. Um, so that's, that's basically the purpose. Which domain do I have to contact? And I don't need to know all the inter-domain details. Uh, sorry, intra-domain details. However, the operational status, if I look in practice, not in the specification, but in practice, it's unclear. Sometimes people saying the operational status is down if there's a problem in my domain, which is logical. Also, if it's a problem between me and the next domain. But sometimes they also report the status down if I just see any problem on the path somewhere. For example, in SCH, there, there could be uh, uh, a far end error, which could be all the way down to another domain, and they see an error, and therefore they say, okay, the operation status is down, because that's, for them, the situation. But that doesn't really help pinpointing the error, because it just says, okay, I see an error somewhere on the path. I am just don't know where it is. And that could even worse if, for example, in, in the example down there, um, domain C has to report. Uh, let's say this is an STH connection between A, B, and C. Domain B is not participating. There's a, uh, a far end error of there's error between uh, domain A and B. So domain C on the, on the link of the interface on the left hand side sees for the path a far end error, but the section there's no error and the line there's also no error. So should it report an error or not? Well, our view is that only a loss of signal should be reported, uh, not for errors uh, on, on, on the path uh, level. And actually it's getting worse because even if there's a far end error, SEH has a feature which is called automated laser shutdown, meaning, oh, this port on the left hand side is down, I don't see a signal, so I'm going to shut down that Ethernet port on the right hand side. And 
domain D sees, oh, the port goes down. Oh, domain C has a problem. You, you have a problem. Well, domain C has nothing to do with it. And again, that doesn't really help in point pointing the problem. So this is actually an example where actually we, we need that multi-layer information. We need to know the correlation between SDH and, and Ethernet and what's going on there. Um, what we've done now, we try to, to make a circuit uh, uh, crossing domains uh, without saying, okay, technology doesn't matter. We, we just abstract that away. Uh, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. I, I would love that work that way, but it doesn't. So we need that multi-layer information. And if you use NML, we can have that uh, multi-layer topology information. I'll skip this slide. So what I'm proposing is, okay, um, what is useful? What would someone ask for end-to-end -end mon? Well, which direction is a problem? Do you as a domain have a problem? Or do you see a problem on the far end side or, or the near side? Or maybe on both sides? So that's, that's the most simple status I like to know. And then how far away is the problem? For example, for SDH, you have the line or the, the section or the path. And for Ethernet OM, where it's a colleague of mine is just having a talk in the other room, which you could have went to as well, uh, you have multiple levels, uh, level uh, 0 to 7. Uh, seven is, uh, 5, 6, and 7 are, are the end-to-end uh, -end connection for the customer, while 0 and 1 are for the provider domain, and the other one is for, I think, the administrative domain. So you can more or less say, okay, I see a, l a problem on layer 3, that means, okay, I see a problem within the administrative domain, but not in the, uh, uh, therefore also in the user domain, but not in my local, uh, 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 operational domain. So you know more or less where the problem is, how far away it is. And also perhaps uh, when was the problem. So should you also lock alarms and, and, and clearance of alarms. And that concludes my slides. So that's, that's more, uh, yeah, uh, how to use Entwent Mon in practice. And that's, I think, an open question. Thank you, Frank. Some questions from the audience, Bill? There's the mic. <laughs> so let's say we have a dozen interfaces mm -hmm. which are connected together in a certain configuration. And 10 seconds later, the configuration changes. All these dozen interfaces have different connections. And a second later, they change again. They all have different connections. That is A, B, and C, A to B, B to C, A to C, B to A. I'm thinking of two scenarios in which this could happen, one of which, of course, is that there's a uh, white light's optical switch underneath, and the other is in a wireless network. And so how do you, uh, does it, it's not clear to me that you could use this approach in a situation like that, but maybe I'm wrong. To be honest, uh, even as an animal co-chair, I, I am inclined to say that this doesn't scale if you really are going to, to scale it up to IP layer or, or really a uh, packet layer in, in the first even place. Even uh, so, the sorry. Even just representing the link layer. Uh, well, I think it does scale up there. Um, if you have multiple layers, and meaning that uh, on one of the lower layers, something configuration changes, and therefore all the uh, channels on top of that changes, is that what you, the example what you mean? In that case, you just have to describe the change in, in the underlying layer. And yes, of course, the whole topology changes, but that's more a problem of how to get that information out there and then of scalability. Um, and actually, this is one of the problems, and there's this distinction between uh, the monitoring and the, the pathfinding people. Uh, the pathfinding people really like to aggregate a lot, which is, makes sense. Uh, you're not going to describe each VLAN individual. However, monitoring, you might want to do that if they are all in use, obviously. Um, how to solve that? Well, I don't know. If, if that's really the number of links in use, uh, uh, then you also you really have to describe that if you want to monitor them. Uh, how this solution scales, uh, I'm sure we'll bump to some problems there, but uh, I think we'll be able to solve it as well. Great, thanks. Any more questions? I have only one remark, though, that SDH hopefully will go away. Yes, I agree. But we also and have that's a layers. good thing. So, sure, so but uh, yeah. you will have the DWDM layer, which will hopefully yeah. be more dynamic than 
than it is today. If actually, it is pretty dynamic with WSSs. Uh, you will have different layers, different colors on that. Uh, and on top of that, we will see the, the OTN layer, and on top of that, the NEAT and the layer, which will be much more flexible than we see today, or yeah. maybe the MPLS TP layer. Uh, I'm sure we will have multiple layers for the foreseeable future. Probably, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Well. So I would like to invite uh, Arne Oslevo from Uninet, who will, uh, will be yet another talk on Persona. Okay, the floor is yours. Okay, so hello everyone. So I'm going to talk about Persona NC. Well, NC stands for NetConf. So this is a NetConf-based Persona impl implementation. You already heard a little bit about the Persona infrastructure in the first presentation, so I'm not going into any big detail uh, of uh, the technical details of this. But I will say a little bit about the motivation we have behind our work. Also we really uh, like the idea behind uh, Persona. Also having an infrastructure where you, uh, a client can use a lookup service to connect to different domains is something that we really think is useful and really is needed in uh, a modern network. But unfortunately, the current implementations of Persona has some uh, problems. Uh, one of the biggest issues, at least in our opinion, is that there's no common data model for measurement archives and measurement points. What this means is that every time someone creates a new type of measurement archives that exports new types of data, or uh, add, uh, add new metrics to an existing uh, measurement archive, then no one can talk to that uh, measurement archive unless you also implement a new client or extend the, uh, an existing client. So in, uh <coughs> oh sorry. So that's uh, one of the first issues that we wanted to fix with our implementation. And also, as was mentioned after the first presentation, there are also some performance issues with the current implementations. So with our uh, Persona NC, we wanted to create a single data model for all measurement archives. And uh, we start out by create, creating a high-level data model, and then we also needed some kind of uh, modeling language. So we ended up using uh, Young as the modeling language, which means that we had to use uh, NetConf as a transport uh, protocol. Uh, and uh, one of the big advantages of having a common uh, data model is that you can write generic tools to query and retrieve data. And so you can compare this to uh, NetSNMP for uh, what no most network operators use. As if uh, SNMP was used in the same way as the current uh, persona, it would mean that every time a new MIB was released, you had to make changes to actual uh, SNMP libraries to retrieve the data. So we think that you should have generic tools to retrieve data, and then you can just add small scripts on top to present the data in the way that you want it to. So uh, right now, our implementation is uh, focused on measurement archives, but it can be easily be extended to all uh, persona services. So we are going to create models for also measurement points and lookup service uh, very soon. Uh, our implementation is also very fast and has a relatively small code base. So we'll come back to that on the later slides. And at least we think it's easy to implement new measurement archives because of the small code base. And it has a powerful query mechanism. Also we use XPath, which is an optional query mechanism in the NetConf uh, protocol. So here's the general overview of the data model that we have created for the measurement archive. So the general idea here is that the, this data model should contain all necessary information that a client needs for querying and presenting data from the measurement archive. So you can see the main uh, structure. So on top, you just have the Persona NC uh, uh, node. So, we, <coughs> so we have some general information, or contact information, and so on. And then you have a list of measurement archives. And in the future, we will also define a list of measurement points and lookup service, and so on. And uh, each uh, measurement archive can also have different data sources. That's just a way of organizing uh, com uh, data from the same measurement archive, but that has come from different sources. And then inside each data source, you have the information you need to query uh, this uh, data. So you have a list of observation points so that gives you all the information that you need for about observation points. You have uh, time informa information. For example, some measurement archives might, might have uh, the hourly, daily, weekly, monthly data available, while some only have uh, five minutes and hourly intervals available. So everything is defined inside uh, this subtree. And then you have the reports info. That's uh, what defines the data that can be exported by the measurement archive. So in there, you f uh, a client can find all the information about the name of the data and also the type. 
So if a client retrieves uh, some number from the measurement archive, this will tell uh, this here will tell it if that number is an IP address, uh, temperature, bit per second, and so on. So that it can format the number in a proper way for the user interface. Uh, here you can see the overall uh, design. So we have uh, on the server side, you have a, a Persona NC daemon. We also support both SSH and uh, SOAP interfaces that the clients can connect to. The main reason for SSH is that you have to support SSH if you support uh, NetConf. So that's uh, uh, it's mandatory to support. So for a uh, Persona design, the SOAP interface is probably the best one to use and it's also faster than the SSH. And uh, between the, so the SSH and SOAP uh, code that's uh, here is mostly acts as a proxy between the clients and the daemon. So uh, in, in here we just use local sockets for uh, communication. Here you can see a bit, a bit more details about how the daemon has uh, been built up. So you have the main uh, daemon code on top. And then based on our configuration file, it will load the different uh, measurement archives that are available. And the measurement archives are uh, implemented as a class that implements an abstract uh, measurement uh, archive uh, definition. And there's also some common uh, code that can be used by all uh, measurement archives. And one of the reasons why we think it's uh, relatively is easy to implement the new measurement archive is that all XML processing is done either inside the daemon itself or inside the common code here. So there's no need to do any net, uh, XML processing at all inside the actual code for the measurement archives. So for example, the test uh, MR that we have implemented is just a simple uh, measurement archive that uh, exports some randomly generated uh, data. But this is less than 100 lines of code to implement that uh, measurement archive. So it's something I'm going to do in an uh, hour or two if you uh, want to. And uh, you have just have to implement a class with some well-defined uh, interfaces. For example, you have one interface that's called the get observation points that just lists all the observation points that are available for that measurement archive. Uh, everything is implemented in uh, PHP, and uh, it's a relatively small code base. I'll come back with some numbers uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, we have also implemented a simple uh, the utility, as a command line in utility, that can be used as a, as a generic tool that can be used to query the measurement archive. So here you see one simple example on how it can uh, be used. So in this example, I connect to the local host, and then I send an XPath query where I said that in this case, I want to retrieve the name of uh, all observation points that starts with Bergen 7. And then the utility just simply prints out the XML uh, response that I got back from the server. In this case, you got back uh, two interfaces with the exact same name. If I in the query had said that I also wanted the direction of the interface, I would have seen that this was actually ingoing and outgoing of the same uh, interface. But it's a very, uh, so you can just use the expert query to get the information that you need. You can also uh, use it to retrieve uh, data from the measurement archive. And uh, when you retrieve uh, reports or data, then uh, the result is uh, presented in a CSV-like uh, format. That means that it's very easy to import uh, necessary data into uh, other uh, tools. For example, inside uh, GNU plot, as if you start GNU plot, you can just write a plot command, and then you can pipe in the results from MR query. In this case, I'm uh, connecting to the RD MR and I get the, the results from one single observation point and for one day of uh, traffic. Uh, this report will return both bit per second and arrow counters, so I just uh, pipe it along to a grab and cut uh, command to just uh, single out just a bit per second. And then I get a nice graph from uh, GNU plot. And since we use a common data model, you can use this exact same command by just changing a few uh, arguments here. You can then plot from NetFlow uh, measurement archive or, or the, any, any other measurement archive that will be implemented in the future. And the exact uh, values for uh, what you put up uh, here is something that you can query uh, from the measurement archive before you run this command. And if you had a graphical user interface, you would typ typically have drop-down menus uh, for this. But of course, uh, one of the advantages of using NetConf is that there are quite a lot of other tools available. So if you don't like the, our MR query implementation as a command line tool, yeah, then just use one of the other ones that are available. Here is an example that's from NC Client, which is a Python library. If you download the source code for uh, NC Client, you will find one example file that's called NC03. Uh, that's what the entire contents of that file is shown here. I don't, you don't have to look at the details, but it just shows that in uh, 10, 12 lines of code, we have a fully functional client 
that can connect to the measurement archive, send an uh, XPath uh, query, and retrieve data. Which means that for network operators, it will be very easy to uh, create their own scripts. And if you don't like Python, there's also uh, C uh, libraries available for NetConf, and also a Java library. So now we have a basic idea of what uh, Persona NC is about and how it's been implemented. So how does it compare to the existing Persona versions? Well, we've done now some uh, extensive testing of this. Uh, where we have looked at three main categories uh, of comparison. We have looked at the general performance and query mechanisms. We have looked at uh, more detail at scalability, where we tested both the number of interfaces in a measurement archive and also the number of simultaneous clients. And we have looked at the code base. So we tested both our DMR, uh, where we configured 1,000 interfaces, and we used both the utilization as a bit per second and uh, arrow counters. And we also looked at the uh, NetFlow measurement archive, where we had 10 routers with 65 uh, interfaces. So you can see some of the results. And here you have also the performance problems that is with the current Java version of Persona. The so first uh, query we tried to do was to get all information about all available interfaces that, uh, that was in the server. So we configured it with 1,000 interfaces. So in the Java version, that actually took 42 seconds before we got uh, any response back. While on uh, the Perl version, it was 660 milliseconds, and uh, our persona uh, net, uh, so NC was just 190 uh, milliseconds. So I said the main reason for this uh, the Java version being so slow is uh, scalability issues. Also, 1,000 interfaces for the Java version. Uh -huh. uh, this is the current stable version. It's just uh, too much. Uh, when it comes to the Perl version, I should say that these are preliminary numbers. We have not discussed the results that we got with the developers. We are going to contact them to see if there are any optimization that might be done. Also, we have installed everything according to the documentation. And everything works correct, and we get the responses that we want back. But as I said, there might be optimization techniques that can be used. But with the Java version, uh, this is in line with a report that was written a couple of years ago that uh, tested the performance, and we get similar or better results than uh, that report. Uh, then we wanted to run a more advanced query. We just wanted the name of the interfaces. So we were not inter interested in all other information. And you can see then that uh, in our NetConf uh, uh, version, also Persona NC, it's down to uh, 90 milliseconds because it's less data that has been transferred over the network. But this kind of query is not possible in uh, regular person personas. So you have to download all the information uh, uh, and then you have to process it on the client side. And the same goes with the third one, where we just wanted the interfaces starting with uh, Bergen. Again, Persona NC is down to 40 milliseconds, while the other ones, you still have to uh, process everything. Then we looked at uh, retrieving the last link load and error for one specific uh, interface. Then the Java version is, uh, takes 4.1 seconds, while the Perl is 590 milliseconds, and uh, NC is uh, just 60 milliseconds. But this is where things get a little bit uh, strange, because uh, so far the Perl version has been faster than the Java version. But uh, when it comes to retrieve the last link load and error for all interfaces, then suddenly the Perl version is the slowest one. So this is one of the things that we have to discuss and see if there are optimization techniques that can be used to be improved. It. But I say it's almost two minutes just to get all the data available, while our implementation takes uh, just uh, 4.3 seconds. And most of that time is spent reading through 1,000 RD files. Of course, retrieving all the information about 1,000 interfaces is usually not a report that you are that interested in. But uh, one type of reports that most network operators are interested in is for example, get top 10 interfaces with the most traffic, or uh, get the uh, name of all the uh, uh, interfaces that had errors on them in the last time period. In uh, Persona, we actually have built-in support for that kind of uh, reports, and that means that we transfer less data over the network, so it uh, takes a little bit less time, but you still have to process all of the RD files. But again, that kind of advanced queries are not possible with uh, the regular persona, so you have to uh, retrieve all the information and then uh, process it on the client side. So the reason why this is about half the time for this one here is that here I uh, wanted both the link load and error for all the interfaces. Here I'm just looking at the traffic. So in regular persona, you actually have to do two queries to get uh, that information. So it takes twice as long. We then looked at the uh, performance of, of uh, query mechanisms of NetFlow. Uh, I've on this presentation, uh, I've just uh, looked at the query mechanisms, because the performance is usually tied up in processing the raw NetFlow data. But uh, this example here clearly shows the lack of a common data model on, uh, in the regular persona. 
So here I wanted to use the same queries that I did on the RD demo. I want to get the information about all interfaces, just the name of the interfaces, and then interfaces we start with the Bergen. But in the Netflow demo, uh, that's in the regular persona, there is no support for uh, interfaces, as there's no information about available interfaces. In that uh, measurement archive, you actually have to know everything in advance, and you have to specify the router that you want data for and which if index you want to get the information for. So this demonstrates the fact that every time there's a completely new type of Emma uh, in a regular uh, persona, you actually have a learning curve because you have to look at the data model that they use because each one can have different data models. Then we have the scalability and number of uh, interfaces. Uh, so here we just wanted to increase the number of interfaces that are available. So we used the RD Emma, it doesn't say on the slide. But uh, we then said we just retrieve the last link load and arrow for one specific interface. So the 1,000 interfaces is similar to the first slide that I showed in performance. But then we increased the numbers, and on Persona NC, we went up to half a million interfaces. And you can see that even with half a million interfaces, we are still faster than 1,000 interfaces in the Java implementation. We tried increasing uh, up to 10,000 for the Java version, but then we just got an error message. Yeah, and that is on our server with 20 gigabytes of uh, memory. By some tuning and experimentation, we managed to get around 3,000 interfaces, but it was just so slow that it was really not uh, usable at uh, all. The same with the Perl version. That's it, that actually handles uh, 10,000 interfaces, but uh, it took two minutes to retrieve information about one single uh, interface, so it's really not usable in any practical sense. And you can see that the uh, over implementation is 100,000 interfaces. It's a slightly faster than 1,000 interfaces of the uh, Perl version. We also looked at uh, the code base, and the most important here is the actual code for the measurement archives. Because that has to, uh, tells you a little bit about the work involved in implementing a new uh, service. So you can look at the RD Emma. So here you can see in the Java version, it's 1,600 lines and 2,500 for the Perl version. While we have 174 lines of PHP code, and actually about 50 of those lines are just uh, a parse or to actually parse the XML file that defines the observation points for the regular persona. So the actual uh, measurement archive is uh, just 120 lines or something like that. And you also have to write a small XML file that describes the data that you're exporting. So it says that uh, the first, uh, so the data is uh, bit per second, arrow counters, and uh, so on. So, that, uh, so in general, uh, the Persona NC is about 10% the code uh, base of the other uh, implementations. I haven't included any XML on these because uh, you, you really don't, uh, so strictly speaking, you don't need it. But uh, since you're actually, if you're, also, there are quite different data models for the RDM and NetFlow, and usually you will have to write some XML schemas to define these different uh, types. So there will be s or XML files here as well. The common uh, libraries, as I said, that doesn't uh, worry me too much because uh, that's something that the normal uh, developers won't uh, have to uh, deal with. So uh, right now we only have just over 600 lines of PHP code, but this will increase in our implementation. As we are still lacking features, as we don't have any access control, and for the to be able to claim full netconf compatibility, we also have to implement something called uh, subtree uh, filtering. So uh, this will increase in the Persona NC implementation, but uh, this will not uh, affect the uh, number of lines uh, on the, the actual uh, uh, measurement archives. We actually have some ideas that this can be simplified even further by uh, moving things into common uh, code. And then I'm actually close to finished. So just a summary, as I have presented Persona NC, which is an uh, alternative Persona implementation with NetConf and Young. Uh, most people, when I present this, uh, get stuck on the fact that we've used NetConf and Young. But I think actually our main contribution here is the common measurement archive data model. So that it means that you can create a generic tool to query measurement archives. If you compare our uh, solution to a person a regular persona, we have more features, we are faster, better scalability, and less code. But there is still a work to do on uh, this implementation, so we have to implement the missing features that I already mentioned. Uh, we have to stabilize things a little bit. We have to have add a little bit more of error handling and things like that. And we're also planning on implementing a generic web user interface that can be used to query and retrieve data for all measurement archives. 
So the code is available on uh, this URL. So you can download it. It's version 0.11 or something like that right now. And you can also contact me on this email address. Okay. Um, thank you, Arne. <laughs> Any question from the audience? Domenico and then Alex. Hello, thank you very much, Arne, for this interesting yeah. talk. Uh, my name is Domenico Vicinanz. I'm the uh, Persona MDM um, product <laughs> manager. Um, so I agree on the statistics you you plot about the 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 Java the Java version. Yep. Um, I just would like to say those are the statistics up to so yeah, correctly mentioned the current yep. version of of Persona, so the one which is currently available. I just would like to say that uh, we are we are working since uh, beginning of 2010 on this this problem. We identified which was the uh, which was the problem? It was not the uh, the access to the RID files, but was the database backend, yeah. which was the in the access database. We uh, restructured completely the uh, the components, and now it is MySQL based. And I have here the graphs, yeah. and the okay. performance are now uh, absolutely uh, better than yeah. than before. Instead of 40 seconds, it's now so to retrieve thousand interfaces is less than 1.8 seconds. Okay. So that that just to to complete the um the, the whole the whole picture. So we, we did big big step in uh in the in the performances of our Java version. Yep, no thank you. I'll be happy to test that one as well then when it's uh, mm -hmm. possible. But uh, just to go back to the testing. I said one you can uh, one issue is that you then fix is that it will be better because you don't get use the exist database. But we also think so the reason why uh, the, the Perl version is so slow when you come up to all, uh, when you query all interfaces, we think is actually related to the rather complex XML of uh, Persona. Yes. Because it's quite uh, time consuming to generate and parse that uh, because of lots of uh, references to each other. Mm -hmm. So uh, it might not solve everything, but we will be happy yep. to test it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, Domenico, I think as well your uh, your answer also answered another question we had whilst you were still uh, sleeping uh, <laughs> in the morning. Just joking. <laughs> okay, we have one more question there. If uh, you were to migrate to the NetConf version of Persona, would it be a simple drop-in or is there a migration process? No, this is not as I uh but it's still early, but it, uh, we don't have the same uh, protocols. So they're not compatible with your, if it is order, no. But uh, for the uh, for the RDMR, then it will be a drop, on, a drop in if everyone uses this version, because we have, as I said, we implemented a tool that uh, actually reads the configuration files of the existing RDMR and then converts it to what we are using. And Simon? Um, nice work. Uh, oh. Thanks, Anne. Yeah. Um, as an alternative to NetConf, have you also looked at simpler uh, REST JSON interfaces to get this information? Because I think that would be the fashionable thing uh, to do. Yeah. Of course, I'm flattered that you use NetConf. Yeah, but uh, well, one of the reasons we use NetConf and Young is that we really like to use uh, XML as much as possible because we, there are so many libraries available. And that's also why we've been, been able to do all this. Because also the total, um, as know, we have three available measurement archives. And everything is working. We have quite advanced uh, features where you can sort, you can get top 10 lists, everything like that. And we are talking about 1,500 lines of code. I don't think that will be possible with JSON and uh, other t tools. All right. Unless there are more questions, I would like to. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, okay. Uh, th thank <laughs> okay. you, Arne. Uh, thank you. Thanks. And uh, I would like to close the session. However, I have some bad news. Uh, well, you won't have to stay here. <laughs> but uh, uh, for the lunch, uh, I was told to relay you this news, which affects me as well, that unless you have booked for um, for session in the afternoon, you won't get lunch. I will suffer myself as well, so. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks all and enjoy the coffee break and the rest of the uh, conference.